Hi there. In today's lecture, we're going to wrap up with a discussion of contemporary art in China. Contemporary art in China has at best been sort of ignored by the government and at worst been horribly suppressed by the Communist Party government. And in that alternating ways of sort of opening up to the world and then clamping down, there's always been this great sense of sort of chaos and confusion and uncertainty about the role of art in contemporary China. To that end, we can see the ways in which the creativity in China has been spurred by these conflicts. Shortly after the Cultural Revolution, there was a real fascination for everything of the past, folk arts, um, and especially a kind of fascination with the exotic and the sort of unknown of the of the past, this sort of folk art. Tung, Hung Tung, was a outsider artist, meaning he was not formally trained, who created these sort of fantastical images of deities, and he sort of created his own imaginary characters and language, and the sort of phantasmagoric nature of his art gave rise in the 70s, a lively debate in Taiwan between admirers and detractors of his work in a country which naive art, or what's sometimes called brute, art brute, until then had been sort of unknown concepts. So there was a kind of freshness, a kind of excitement about this art. At the same time, it sort of negated a lot of the sort of traditional values and ideas of, of professionalism in art. Here's another example of Hong Tong, and you can get a better idea of the kind of characters that were sort of like Chinese characters, but also like people. You can see them wearing hats and clothing, and they kind of are these really sort of wonderful, complicated characters. And his work is very reminiscent of folk art and tapestries. Another kind of art really was a sort of hearkening back to the past. Uh, Lu Fusheng created a series of paintings called Phoenix Hairpin, where he told a story from an old uh, style Beijing opera, and he did it with these sort of uh, oval framed pictures with this antiquary style and the treatment of the image and the shape of the frame was to sort of harken back to the Song Dynasty uh, where this style of art would have flourished. And so there was a sense of sort of nostalgia for the past, a sense of longing for the beauty and the innocence of the past. We also see here uh, this sort of wonderful, uh, simple, abstract, again, a kind of primitivist painting playing on some ideas of cubism and uh, sort of a Paul Clay sort of uh, garden of, uh, in a way that is looking at uh, modernity and in ways that artists were really forbidden to paint during the Mao years. As China opened up, young students who grew up uh, began demanding more and more rights uh, and more and more privileges. And there was a sort of pivotal moment in Tiananmen Square in 1989 when the students occupied uh, the center of Beijing in Tiananmen Square and really demanded uh, greater freedoms. And this came at a time when, you know, communism in Russia and in China was really being questioned. You know, the ideas of Mao and the idea of the revolution, uh, people who didn't grow up with that, the ideology of China seemed hollow. And so there was a real clamor for this. 
in the center of Tiananmen Square, the students from in their many camps erected a sort of statue of liberty. In this case, a figure holding a torch by two hands uh, to show the sort of urgent need for the light of democracy. After about a month of occupying the Tiananmen Square, the government called in the military. Martial law was employed and there was a massive crackdown that led to this sense of um, the need for the students to disband or face uh, violent suppression. No one knows exactly how many students died in Tiananmen Square. Uh, the government claims about 200 to 300 students uh, died, uh, but other independent sources say the number is e easily 10 times that. One of the most iconic images to emerge out of the student resistance to the military oppression was the image of the tank man, um, a young man uh, crossing the street with what looked like a bag of groceries, stopped and stood in front of a line of tanks and would not budge. And the tank commander uh, tried to reason with him. They tried to get around him. But at every turn, he stood there and refused to budge. And eventually, he walked off. No one has ever claimed being the tank man, and no one's quite sure what happened to them and no one has ever come forward and identified themselves as that person. Other kinds of suppression that have emerged in China at this time was the very violent suppression of the Falun Gong movement. Falun Gong was a kind of popular following uh, meditation and exercise uh, group that had kind of spread out through the internet and uh, had a, a numerous followings in many cities across China. People get up every morning and exercise together and sort of subscribe to this kind of simplistic ideology by this Li Hongxi. What happened was they presented China with a challenge. They demonstrated that their numbers were in the millions and that they were autonomous organization that could mobilize through the internet very quickly. So this was seen as a threat to the Communist Party and they were crushed. Li Hongxi escaped uh, to the West and there was a concerted effort to suppress the Falun Gong uh, many of its leaders and followers were sent out to work camps uh, where they were given very long prison sentences. The thing that this taught the Communist Party was they needed to regulate the Internet. And everyone thought that this would be a project they couldn't possibly succeed at. And against all odds, the Communist Party has put enormous resources now into policing and regulating the internet. Let's talk about some of the more famous contemporary artists. Uh, one of my personal favorites is Xu Bing. Here he has in a cage two sheep where you can see the writing and the words are where they're holding the sheep in place. Now this uh, installation was actually uh, set up in a number of places in the United States, including Eastern Illinois University. And this was set up at the Tarbell Arts Center uh, in 1997, just a few years before I arrived on campus. And I was told by many people that this was the most extraordinary thing that you would go in and there was these surveillance cameras on the people watching and that inside the pen with the sheep were actually these monitors as if the sheep would be watching the people watching them. The sense of surveillance, the idea of cages, and that language plays this key role in the way in which we frame our reality. 
these are important ideas to Xu Bing. And language and the use of language have been very important ideas in contemporary art in China. Here is Xu Bing's perhaps most famous work, uh, Books from the Sky from 1988. This enormously ambitious installation is contains a huge number of printed books and then these scrolls that sway down from the ceiling and then uh, cover the walls. Every one of the characters in this text was something that he invented. All of these words in all of these books is nonsense. They look like Chinese characters, but they are not. They represent something that's sort of like a Chinese character, but really is a kind of fiction of his own. So Chinese people, when they see this, they first feel like it's something they should know, but it's just outside of reach. He did a very interesting thing with this uh, collection of characters. He created on the web his ideogram namer, where people could go online and make suggestions about what they thought the character meant. And so he would then collect and rank answers so that people could look at these um, definitions that they were sort of inventing the meaning of something which had been originally nonsensical. This really speaks very powerfully to the loss of meaning in language. Uh, you can imagine after the Cultural Revolution with so much propaganda and uh, so much ideology being foisted on people, there was in the end a kind of exhaustion, uh, a, a sense that language had lost its meaning. And this way of kind of reinventing language was a way of kind of changing the way people perceive language to be. There also was in 1979, shortly after the Cultural Revolution, uh, a massive change to Chinese language. Uh, they broke the tradition of the past, whereby it was related to the sort of classical uh, traditions of Chinese characters. They simplified the language and they made it more a tonal language, kind of moving away from pure ideogrammatic character generated language to something that's more like an alphabet and a fewer number of characters necessary to read and understand. What that meant, though, what was so shocking was a kind of break with the past that younger generations, as they learned this new system of writing, would not grow up like generations in the past with an ability to read the works of great literature and ancient China. This was a work that Xu Bing made uh, in 2004 uh, in response to the terrorist attack 9-11. The work is called Where Does the Dust Itself Collect? And it's from a poem that he has inscribed in dust on the floor of this gallery in Edinburgh. Now, this dust on the floor is actually dust from the city of New York during the terrorist attack. He was in New York at this time and he collected the dust. He knew he wanted to do something with it when he was in New York, but he wasn't sure how to get it out of the country. Um, airport security was suddenly very high. And the only way he could think to get it out was if he could disguise somehow this dust that he had. So with some experimentation, he was able to realize he could mold it by adding some water to it. It would kind of become a clay that would become hard. So he took his daughter's doll, he cut it open, and he pressed it into the shape of a doll. And cast it in a way that it would look just like a toy in his luggage, hard and indifferent. And so the doll shape then 
when he got through uh, customs, he was able to set it up. He was able to repowderize this dust and then shoot it with a fan throughout the room so it settles down evenly across the floor. And then he, where he had pre previously laid down these words, he picked them up. So what you read on the floor are these letters that have been left in negative from where the dust hasn't settled. And so the poem he is referring is a part of an ancient Chan Buddhist statement, as there is nothing from the first, where does the dust itself collect? To understand this, you have to have a pretty sophisticated knowledge of Chan Buddhist philosophy, because this statement is actually a part of a slightly larger comment that was in response to another comment. So let's put these all together. The comment that he is referring to is, the body is the Bodhi tree, the soul is like a mirror bright, take heed and keep it always clean, and let no dust collect upon it. So this was the original idea, that there were these things, the body is this thing that leads us to enlightenment, the soul is like the mirror bright, and you must always keep it clean and not let any dust collect upon it. Now in response to this idea of sort of traditional Buddhist ideology of, of you know, the form of enlightenment is the sort of steps toward uh, achieving a goal, the response was, the Bodhi, true wisdom, is not like the tree. The mirror bright is nowhere shining, as there is nothing from the first. Where does the dust itself collect? Suggesting that there is no clear path to enlightenment, and that our assumptions and ideas about things of this world would not help us, lead us to understand what's going on. And so he's commenting on 9-11 that the result of this attack is not something we can immediately attribute to one thing or another, and that we may misunderstand uh, our, our current situation. In a sense, it was a kind of a warning to take heed against assuming we understand what's going on in our lives. So other artists who dealt with uh, nonsense language, Gu Wenda, in his pseudo seal script that it was made of human hair, again, sort of an invented language uh, that uh, sort of looks like it should mean something. I also really love this image by Bai Liu, a calligraphy of flies, where it sort of looks like language, but it also is just a collection of swatted flies. The idea of a dead language, the idea of a, you know, a transient and meaningless kind of language. We also have Hong Yuan Qing's The Red River Flows East 2010 poem by Li Yu from the Tang Dynasty. So this is uh, new calligraphy. You see how loose it is, how it's shifting and moving and, and swaying in a kind of emotional way, a very expressive kind of writing. The last two lines of this poem he has quoted read, How much sorrow does a man have to bear, as much as a river of spring water flowing east? Bodies and language are two really powerful ideas in contemporary Chinese art. Here we see Chu Ji Jie and his assertion that media, saturated age, signs and codes have kind of overpowered actual human beings and our bodies have become merely their vehicles. So the character he's written here, Bu, means no, and it's written across his body and the wall behind him, sort of flattening him out 
obscuring his individuality. There's a, the idea of the absurd and the idea of uh, anonymity, lack of identity, can be found in Shang Han's performance uh, to add one meter to an unknown mountain, 1995, where he and a few friends stack themselves up on top of a mountain in a kind of absurd gesture to achieving some kind of greater greatness. Uh, the human cost of these, notice how their hair kind of piles up together, this sort of way in which they just become uh, sacrificed to this uh, absurd goal in the way in which many of the sort of grand projects of China come at a terrible human cost. Perhaps one of the most uh, wonderful and imaginative artists we see uh, who's using photography and a kind of performance is Liu Bo Lin, who uh, has this way of sort of painting people out uh, are into the environment so that they become sort of ghostly shadows within the space. You can see here these people look like they're sort of disappearing in the sort of industrial complex. Also this really startling image here of someone holding on to someone who is kind of vanishing. This uh, speaks very powerful to the way in which the Chinese government would make people sort of disappear, uh, write them out of history. They would, in effect, just vanish. His uh, sort of vanishing act has become more uh, elaborate and more creative over time. Here, Liu Bin has sort of talked about Chinese consumerism and the way in which we are sort of disappearing within that. You can also see him um, disappeared into the Beijing Olympics and uh, Tiananmen Square, the Forbidden City. Commercialism and communism share a really uneasy balance in modern China. Uh, Coca-Cola and other companies have moved in and the kind of uh, urgency and agency with which communism once um, sort of challenged ideas of the West, we now at once uh, embrace them in this sort of uneasy way in which modern China has become a part of the modern world at the same time it uh, continues to resist these ideas. And so the color red, which is so often associated with the Communist Party, is now sort of cheerily promoting Coca-Cola. Here we see on the right uh, the dancing figure of the ballet wet red detachment of women. And there you can find that same sort of Coca-Cola, cheery uh, children, good fortune, uh, sort of celebrated as well, kind of pop icons of contemporary China. Fang Li Jun has made uh, a series of paintings sort of making fun of that sort of uh, precept in communist art that everything must be positive and cheerful and people must look happy. So here he is showing a revolutionary image of freedom leading the people from the French Revolution. And he has sort of recast it now with these Chinese characters who even in death are sort of wildly smiling in this kind of absurd way. Zeng Fangxi has looked more at the sort of grim reality of modern Chinese life, the sort of desperation and alienation that has come with the sort of loss of uh, clear ideas and direction, and that neither commercialism nor government ideology seems to fill the void of most people's lives. Here's a really extraordinary work of art uh, that is based on the Three Gorges Dam, this massive project that, that China undertook 
to uh, create these hydroelectric hydroelectric dams uh, that would power their, these new modern cities. But to build this massive Three Gorges Dam, one of the largest dams in the world, they would have to flood valleys and destroy the traditional way of life of so many people. So this uh, woodblock print really celebrates the 1,500,000 people who were displaced from the area of the reservoir. And so it shows their migration and the way in which they sort of packed up their lives uh, and notice the sort of shift in hues from a kind of colorful, vibrant to a sort of duller gray and brown that becomes ever more washed out as people move out of the region. Now we can see up in the upper part, the waters beginning to emerge and eventually all we have are these last vehicles departing. The waters are rising and in comes the cadre of politicos from the Communist Party in their boat, satisfied with their achievement. The idea of the past and the way it's being recast in a modern way is really a wonderful exploration of Li Xiaofeng, who's created a series of these kind of Western style clothes you can actually wear. He builds a kind of leather garment and then has access to these warehouses of cracked, chipped and broken porcelain plates and bowls. And he carefully kind of uses copper wire to sort of sew them into the leather garment. Uh, to create these really spectacular outfits. Here is Li Xiaofeng and his sort of sport coat made of porcelain fragments. Another really spectacular artist who is doing some very innovative stuff is Kai Guochang. I will uh, put a link to, you can watch his uh, firework uh, performances, which are quite spectacular. So he not only makes, you know, the actual fireworks he commissions and choreographs these massive firework displays, the sort of traditional art of China. He also uses the firework process, the burning and scalding on paper. It creates really imaginative and extraordinary complex compositions through the sort of burning away, uh, sort of a record of this. In ancient China, the firework was a symbol of purification and a symbol of kind of medicine to kind of scare away the ghosts. And that's why you often see so many fireworks being lit on New Year's, Chinese New Year's Eve. Perhaps the most celebrated contemporary artist, uh, the most controversial, at least, is Ai Weiwei, who has done a number of super ambitious projects. On the left, we see his forever brand bicycle played a significant role in his work. He created this sort of Mobius strip of bicycles uh, stacked on top of each other as a way of kind of the idea of multiplicity and the massive um, industrialization of China. There's also something sort of whimsical about Ai Weiwei's work. He is a fierce critic of the Chinese Communist Party and has fought tirelessly to uh, uncover graft and corruption and uh, negligence by the party officials. Perhaps his most celebrated work you see here on the right is this vast, vast field of sunflowers. Each one is a porcelain seed that has been hand painted. The Tate Modern of London uh, laid out uh, a one foot thick carpet of these sunflowers, which consisted of over 100 million hand painted porcelain seeds. This was initially intended for people to actually walk on it, um, 
But then uh, shortly after it opened, they uh, realized that there might be some dust from the porcelain, from all the activity, uh, people walking through it. So they quickly sort of cordoned it off so people could walk uh, along a corridor to the side of the exhibition. Still, it is a stunning testament in which he celebrates the incredible industry and the scale of China. The scale of this piece is to remind us of the human potential that lies in China and that the sort of hope for the freedom of the people. There was an idea very early on in the Communist Party that the Communist Party would allow the people their free voice and they would be heard and the Communist Party would respond to them. And Mao famously said, let a hundred thousand flowers blossom, let a hundred flowers blossom, let a hundred schools of thought contend. And so this idea was an attempt to bring about this sort of a revolution of the people, that people would have sort of freedom of speech. That, of course, has not happened. And this work is meant to be a kind of challenge to the Communist Party to return to those earlier ideals. We can see here a collection of ancient pots that Ai Weiwei has purchased and then covered with this kind of garish household paint. He does these kinds of things to highlight the way the Communist Party has erased or destroyed traditional Chinese culture and that their lack of respect, the way they have sort of bulldozed and eliminated and attacked traditional Chinese culture. And so he does these kinds of things in, uh, as well as a, a performance he captured on film of him just dropping one of these vases, these thousands of years old vases. Ai Weiwei created a series of pieces. We had a reading about this in perusal, uh, 12 animal heads based on the zodiac, Chinese zodiac, that were uh, at one point ensconced in China and were a part of the sort of pillaged artifacts of the West. He created these and displayed these in the West as a way of kind of challenging the idea that they were somehow special or wonderful or unique or worthy of the Communist Party's uh, obsession and sort of making fun of the way that the Communist Party had sort of created a, a sort of false narrative about how these were this important patrimony of the Communist Party that had to be repatriated. Shortly after he created these works and they went on display in the West, Ai Weiwei would be rounded up by the security police and really disappeared for several months. Eventually, he was brought up on charges of tax evasion. All told, he spent 81 days in isolated detention. He has now lives in the West and continues to make work that is critical of the Chinese government.